you believe that it's beneficial to the body of Christ that we have these different denominations? Look there, Ezekiel chapter 28. We'll see this division. And what my point is here, I want to show you the very first three divisions that we have in Scripture has some similarities that we can draw from it. Ezekiel chapter 28 Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. We'll start in verse 12. And the difficulty here is because the, the prophet Ezekiel mentions the king of Tyre in verse 12. So we say, yes, he must be speaking of the king of Tyre, but it does also seem to allude to the idea of Satan or, or Lucifer. A double meaning here. In the end of verse 12, it says, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were the holy mount on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you out as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. The sin here, found in verse 16 and verse 17, what is it? Say again. Pride. I want you to make mention of that. We have Satan in verse 5. Verse five. Say again. In verse 5, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and what will you be? You will be like God. God. So yeah, they thought God was withholding something. Hey, we could be like God. Come on now. I want that. I want to have what I don't got. I want to be like God. I, 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 I have this desire not to submit to God, but to be like God. I, I want to be able to make my own decisions. I know God said not to do it, but I know better, so I'm just going to go ahead and do it. And it's also a sense of pride. Pride led Eve to take the fruit and listen to Satan and to eat it. And so what does then God do to Adam and Eve? Does it say there at the end of chapter 3? Exactly right. In verse 23 of chapter 3, Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden. He's cast out cast out to such an extent that he was never to return there because an angel cherub was put with a flaming sword so we see Adam and Eve because of pride they were cast out the next division which was a major division we're going to look at is in chapter 11 of Genesis Genesis 11 It says at the beginning of Genesis 11 that they all spoke with the same tongue. They all spoke the same language. What did they desire to do as they spoke with the same language, Adam? What was their desire? Why did they want to build a big tower? Look at at the wording there, if you would, at chapter 11 verse 4 would you read that for us adam chapter 11 verse 4 why do they want to build this tower they said come let us build the city and a tower whose top is in the heavens let us make a name for ourselves lest we be cast abroad scattered abroad over the face of the world excellent 
What was it there that you mentioned? Let us do what for ourselves? We want to... And what's the next phrase? Next phrase, let us make a... What does that mean there, Adam, to make a name for yourself? I really I just want to make a name for myself. What is that? What's that mean? Not so much they want to be like God, but what do they want to do? They want to exalt themselves. We need to look important here. Let's build this big thing so everybody looks at us and says, Wow, look at them guys in Babel. Right? They're making a name for themselves. That's a sense of pride. So what was God's response then? Seeing the pride of all these people speaking all the same language. In verse 8, So the Lord scattered them. Scattered them abroad. I want to just take a few things from these first three references that I've given you. Number one, what is God's attitude towards pride in people? What's his attitude? It's consistent all the way through. What is it? He crushes it. God hates pride. He separates himself from prideful people. It says that God does what to the proud? He resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I want you to get that in your mind, that this idea of pride can kill anything. When we begin to act as prideful people, God says, man, I've got to back up there. We've got to realize that pride will kill us. Pride cometh before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Pride is a killer. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. The exalting that we look for, Adam, is not this type of exalting where I say, man, I'm going to build this. It's going to look real good. Everybody's going to say, good job, Adam. I'm not trying to make a name for myself. We're trying to say we're going to be humble. And then as God exalts us, okay. But we don't try to exalt ourselves. It's the first thing. The third, second thing I want you to see is that who is it that did the casting out and the scattering in all three of these situations? It was God. So does God ever bring about division? You bet he does. Let's look at that passage that I referred to, Matthew chapter 10. This is a strange passage, but Matthew 10 Matthew chapter 10, many of us and all of us actually should say that is God a God of peace? Yes, right? God God is peace. But let's try to make sense of this passage in Matthew chapter 10 verse 34 that he says, I didn't come to bring peace, but what? A sword. Now why would he say I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword? Why would he say that? Look at the next sentence. He says that there's going to be a division. said a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Really? He wants to divide families? Is that what God's all about? He wants son and and, and father to not be together? Malachi seems to say that he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. So what is this all referring to? What type of a division is this that he's talking about? Excellent. Very good. Think about it. We talked about what's going on over in Iraq, right? Mainly a Muslim country. Let's just say that there is a Muslim family and one of the children, that Muslim family, hears about Jesus Christ and they desire to accept Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. Instantly, what happens to that family? It's divided. Divided instantly. Because the Muslim family says, we cannot be with you. We actually may have a a killing of you because of what you've done. And that's what I want you to see, what the gospel does, what the word of God does when it enters into someone's heart. It divides families in some regards. And we must come to realize that oftentimes when we preach God's word, division may come. 
And that division is okay. When God's word is being proclaimed, sometimes people say, I can't handle that. The greatest teacher that ever taught had division in his midst. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. The term disciple, what does the term disciple mean? Luke, give it to us. Disciple means what? A follower, okay? If we were to call ourselves a a disciple, we would say we are followers of Jesus Christ. I want you to remember that as we read this passage in verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, followers of his, heard this. They said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? So when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? Does what I've been teaching offend you? This is verse 61 that I just read, John 6, 61. Now to verse 62. What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you, meaning to his disciples, who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. Verse 66, from that time, many of his followers, his disciples, went back and walked with him no more. So let us understand that we are not better than Jesus in our preaching. That if Jesus preached the gospel... And many turned away. If we preach the gospel, there could come a turning away as well. And that type of division we must be okay with. Not even okay, but embrace. Now, what our temptation may be is that when we begin to see in church gatherings some ruffling of feathers, some dislike with what the gospel preaches, what would might be the tendency for worldly people to do? Change the gospel. We might tend to think, let's change the gospel because we don't like that the the family over there is not happy. We don't want them to leave because they're our biggest givers in the church. We don't want them to leave, so we change the gospel to fit their needs. We can't do that. We don't have the right to do that. Now, let's look at a few other passages with this idea of division. Turn with me, if you would, Titus chapter 3, there is another type of division that we must be aware of and refrain from. How many of you like to get into arguments? Okay, one smiling. I appreciate your honesty. Oh, two smiling. Both in that family. Wonderful. <laughs> huh? <laughs> How many of us like to argue? Don't speak, honey. You like to debate. Excellent. I like the refrain. We like to debate vigorously. Yes. Is it really an argument when you're always right? I mean, it's just, I mean, no. Okay. So here is the idea that we have to be careful of. Titus chapter 3, verse 9, is a tendency with all of us. Titus chapter 3, verse 9. It says, avoid foolish disputes genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Okay, can we just be honest with ourselves? And there are times that there may be disputes that, looking back, we would say were foolish, but at the moment, we thought these are really important. We better, we better argue about this. And that we've spent time arguing about things that really, in the end, have no importance. We have to be careful that we don't get into these foolish disputes, these contentions, these strivings. It says in verse 10 that we're supposed to reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. So there are some that can come into Christian circles that desire to be divisive, that kind of 
get a rush off the idea of causing people feelings and division. Let's flip to another passage, Romans chapter 16. Romans 16. Sixteen, yes. What was yours? The verse is seventeen. I can't read verse twelve. There's too many names I don't know. Verse seventeen. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. The end of Paul's letter here, he's telling the Roman church you need to be aware of the individuals that come and try to cause divisions and contentions. Note them and avoid them. Again, we're recognizing within ourselves that we sometimes like to be divisive. Oftentimes, maybe in my own mind, someone says something and just in my mind I say, the contrary thing is true and try to just in my mind play the opposite side. We call it the devil's advocate. You know, we we try to... I don't know what's within us, but it's oftentimes not godly. The desire to cause defenses or divisions or contention. Another passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Just a page over to your right, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Actually, before, yeah, let's just go there. Let's just go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? What was the problem going on here in this Corinthian church that Paul's saying, hey, there's, there's problems here? Excellent. They're following after a man and saying, maybe this group over here says, hey, Peter's the man. Peter's the guy we're following. We're following after Peter. And this group over says, Paul's the man. Paul's the guy we're following. Some say Apollos, and we're following after Paul's. So Paul's point is, those contentions are ungodly. What must the focus be then, as Paul's saying? Christ. Our head must always be Christ, never a man. I don't know if you're familiar with this gentleman Billy Swaggart, Jimmy Swaggart, not Billy Swaggart, Jimmy Swaggart, maybe you've heard, heard of him. Years ago when I was young, I remember hearing him preach. He became a pretty big name individual in Christendom. Okay, And so then I just remember, I was pretty young when it happened, but I remember um, him having a sexual sin and how things just kind of fell off for many Christians because Swaggart was it. And they look to him in the sense of he's the example and begin to fall away from the gospel because Swaggart sinned. So we have to be careful of that because oftentimes we can take man and promote them to a position they should not be. Same thing is true in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. Paul says that these people are carnal. It says where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am Paul, or another says, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? So we recognize, even within within our own group here, that when strife and envy and division, those contentions arise, it's a sense of carnality that we have to be careful of. So what's important? When we think about division, we want to never divide because of genealogies, because of debates or disputes that are over small things. We don't want that. But flip over with me, if you would, to a passage that shows what we should divide over. First Timothy chapter 1.
1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through verse 6. First Timothy 1, 3 through verse 6. John, would you read that for us, please? As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may uh, charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God, that is, by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons by swerving from these have wandered away into vain discussion. Excellent, thank you. So I want you to see kind of a, a connection. In verse three, he used the word doctrine. Then verse four, he says fables, endless genealogies. Those cause disputes rather than godly edification. And it even mentions in verse 6 that because of those fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes, some have strayed from the faith because of this idle conversation. But he says there in verse 3, what is it that we do not negotiate? He says in verse 3, I charge some that they teach no other doctrine." So we realize that there are times that people may get off on foolish genealogies or things that are of no major intent or purpose. But one thing that we must divide on is doctrine. This was the major reason the Protestant Reformation was the idea of the doctrine of salvation by faith alone through grace alone. That's a doctrine that cannot be negotiated. And we've talked about in the past. He reiterates this. Chapter 6 of this passage. Uh, it's 1 Timothy 6. He says in verse 3. 1 Timothy 6 verse 3. If anyone teaches otherwise. And does not consent to wholesome words. Even the words of our Lord Jesus. And to the doctrine which accords with godliness. If he doesn't do that, if he distances himself, and it says in verse 4, envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, withdraw yourself, verse 5. So if a person gets off on those other things, is not teaching the doctrine, but these other things that are not important, withdraw yourself. And so as you look at your sheet, there are many examples that we could give of such a thing happening of groups that would call themselves Christians that have distanced themselves from God's Word and the teaching of God's Word. And so there was a need for a group of people to say, we must come out of that. So, as we move forward as a group of believers, how do we handle division? How do we handle it when a situation arises and there's disagreement between us? So, where would we go with that? With that topic? How should we find common ground when it comes to topics like that? Or Make a new one. That is a tendency for many groups of people. That was one of our struggles, Ben, when we first started, was the idea that I did not like the concept of let's start another church. Didn't like that. I hated the idea of saying, well, let's just have nine now instead of eight. Because in my mind, I think if an unbeliever were to look at Rich Hill would say, wow, they're all supposedly going to the same place, but none of them can agree. And that just seems strange to me. I mean, I asked the question of him at the same time, will there be different sections for different groups of denominations? Will there be the Methodist corner and the Baptist corner and the non-denominational corner, which I hope is real big? Uh, uh, will there be that up in heaven? No, right? And so I say to myself, well, man, if I'm supposed to spend eternity with that brother, what should I be doing right now with that brother? Should I be calling him bad names and saying, oh, my sakes, those people over there. 
We need to. I believe we need to work at that idea of understanding. And look at this passage in Colossians chapter 3. couple things that I, I, I'm hoping for our fellowship and then as we have contact with people of other groups, we can have these attitudes. Number one is Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 through 15. Therefore is the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. Kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Now, he uses the word long-suffering there, and then he's going to make a connection why long-suffering is important. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anybody has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. But above all, these things put on love. And why is love so important? It says at the end of verse 14, it is the bond of perfection. The NASB says love is the perfect bond of unity. That's what I want to be the first and foremost thought when it comes to disagreements amongst us. Love be the overriding thought. Meaning that if you view something different than I view something, I'm not going to come with hatred towards you. I'm going to recognize that you are a believer, just as I'm a believer, and we're going to have a discussion about it, and we're going to love each other when we're done. Long-suffering. I'll tie long-suffering into this next passage, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Can you give me another word for long-suffering? Patience. Adam Bridgewater, patience. Define that then for us. Okay, you don't get mad. What, you don't get mad at what? Okay. Now, why would you ever get mad at your brother? I mean, they're perfect, so why would you ever get mad at them? Because they're not perfect. <laughs> That's true. See... What Wyatt taught us was that we shouldn't be angry. But anger sometimes comes because we, we're, we're not patient with our brother. I'm just fed up to hear with you talking to me like that. You're not going to steal my toy anymore, man. I'm taking that thing and I'm going. We're not patient people. We want it our way and we want it now. Don't make me wait for it. So this attitude of long-suffering is difficult for us to have. But he says, put it on. Bear with one another. And here's where we got to bear. It says in verse 23, chapter 2, verse 23, avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they do what? They generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not, be, must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. And then what's the next phrase? Able to teach. And then he says, patient. Now, why would a teacher need to be patient? Huh? Sometimes they're not terribly bright. Sometimes they don't catch on real quick. And sometimes they just don't want to frustration of a parenting homeschooling mother my son just won't get math frustrated be patient they're two give them time we have to remind ourselves we got to be patient with each other because we get certain expectations and we try to teach and try to teach and they're just not getting it for one reason or another 
Paul says that we need to be able to teach and we need to be patient. In verse 25, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. We need to be teachers. All of us. And as we think about this future meeting that we may be having as men where we talk about doctrinal, maybe secondary doctrinal issues, we're going to all come to the table and there's a very high probability there's going to be some differencing of opinion. My role will be in that meeting to continue to teach and to teach and to teach and to teach and be patient, be patient, be patient, and realize it may be years before we all come to the same understanding think about Jesus for a minute okay he's got 12 people that he chose right 12 of them one of the course is the son of perdition which was Judas but think about the other 11 for a minute did they have it all together I mean just think about Jesus when he just got done taking care of feeding 4,000 people one time and 5,000 people the next time and he's in a boat and he says beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and what do the what do the disciples say Oh, my sakes, he's upset with us because we forgot, forgot bread. Really? And he says to them, are you really thinking I'm concerned about the bread, guys? I just took care of 4,000 people. I just didn't have it. And Jesus had to be patient with them. We must also be patient. And I ask for that patience with me because I... You know, I had a, an email this week from a gentleman that used to go to church here. Beautiful email, not condemning whatsoever, but just saying that something that happened in the past offended him. And he said, I just want to detail that information to you, and I didn't think you handled that very well. And I don't remember the situation, but it's 100% probable that I did not handle it correctly. So I asked, be patient. I need patience from you just as much as you may need patience from me. We need to realize that we're fallible people that sometimes make decisions that aren't very good. Let's go to one of the thought, Acts chapter 15, which goes to what Ben talked about. Acts chapter 15. There was an issue in verse 2 about circumcision. Acts 15, verse 2. So we've got these individuals over here thinking you've got to be circumcised. Paul and Barnabas over here saying no. And it says something about their disagreements, Paul. What did it say there in verse 2? When therefore Paul and Barnabas had had now small dissension and disputation with them, Determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem for the apostles and elders about this question. Yeah, the words used there, it says no small disagreement, dispute, contention. There was no small. It means this was a big deal. Paul and Barnabas, one side saying this, 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 and they're on that side, no, 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 and dissension's growing. It's a big one. So they said, hey, let's. Let's take this to the apostles and to the elders and let's get some clarity on what's going on here. So in some regard, Ben, you're exactly right that if your family and another family get together and boy, there's just a back and forth and they just can't find any common ground, you know, come to the leadership of the church and say, hey, we need some clarity on what does God's word say here. That's right. That's okay. I will highlight at the end of chapter 15, there is another contention. See, Paul and Barnabas were buddies. They went together on their missionary trips. Barnabas had a cousin. Remember who Barnabas' cousin was? Mark. Mark had gone with them on the journey, and then he left for some reason. So they're going on their second missionary journey, and Barnabas says, hey, let's take Mark with us. And Paul says, not going to happen. He left us when we needed him. We're not taking him. It says in verse 39, the contention became so sharp that they had to part from one another. Sometimes that happens. 
I believe it's sad when it does, but sometimes contentions become so sharp that they just cannot be unity any longer. It must be divided. And to know that God still used both those parties, both Silent Paul and Barnabas. We would say to ourselves that God desires unity, right? God wants there to be unity in the brethren. That he says and he prays in John chapter 17, I desire that they be one just as you, Father, and I are one. So when we look at this picture of all these different groups, can we say they are one and that they are united? Can we say that? Can we say that the Methodists and the Baptists and the Christian church are united? Yes or no, Elijah? All individuals that have believed on Jesus Christ for their salvation and believe the doctrine that we have expressed in the last few weeks, if we have that in agreement, we are united. We are one body. And that prayer that Jesus had in John 17 is true in one regard. Is there more than one body of Christ? Is there more than one faith? Is there more than one spirit? Is there more than one Lord? No, we're just quoting what Ephesians chapter 4, which you guys memorized. Remember all those ones? There's one faith, one spirit, one baptism, one Lord. Remember that? There's only one. So in one regard, we are united, even though we don't go to the same church every Sunday morning. But in a secondary sense, we will be united when Christ returns. When all true believers, whether you're in Iraq, you're in Asia, whether you're in South America or in America, we will be united together beneath the banner of Jesus Christ. What a day that will be. Philippians chapter 2. This is difficult. Let's read. Philippians 1.27 first, and then we'll go to chapter 2. Paul says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. You caught that, of one mind. He repeats that in second, or the second chapter here, verse 1. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. How can we do that this morning as Lighthouse Family Fellowship? Paul gives you the answer in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The way that you and I can be of one mind, if we take the attitude and the mind that Christ had, what was the mind of Christ that he's referring to in verse 5? Who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. What you must do and what I must do so that we have the same mind is become servant-minded. When it is our desire to say, I want to make myself of no reputation, I'm willing to wash your feet and to serve you no matter my title or position, I don't care. And if every one of us can come to the table with that attitude, we'll have the same mind. But it's when we become prideful and begin to think more of ourselves than we ought, that we begin to lose the same mind. I'm saying that when those differences come, if our attitude is right, we'll operate out of love. We'll operate in a way that says, I love you and I want to serve you more than the dissentive attitude that says, I don't care about you. I don't care if you disagree, I'm I'm, I'm going to divide from you. It's more of a joining thought. We're going to try to be like Christ and say we love each other, want to serve each other. It's an attitude that says... um, 
John, they'll know you um, when you have love one for another. We want to demonstrate that in our church, to serve and to love each other. Not that we won't have disagreements and differences, um, but we'll handle those differences differently than if we didn't. All right, let's pray.